Welcome to The Mission Matters. The Mission Matters is a partnership between 1615 and Missio Nexus, who have a shared passion to mobilize God's people to be a part of His mission. The Mission Matters is hosted by Matthew Ellison, President of 1615, and Ted Esler, President of Missio Nexus. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Support Raising Solutions. Support Raising Solutions is a Christian ministry that serves the body of Christ around the world to provide biblical and practical training on how to raise your support and launch your ministry. They desire to flood the nations with great commission workers who are spiritually healthy, vision-driven, and fully funded. And now, here are your hosts, Matthew Ellison and Ted Esler. Welcome once again to the Mission Matters Podcast. I'm Matthew Ellison, and as always, I am joined by my good friend and partner in crime, Ted Esler. Ted, it's always good to see you, brother. Good to see you. Hey, I saw you last night. We actually did an event last night. Uh, I don't know when this will actually air, but last night was the virtual book launch. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm going to get the title wrong if I try to reproduce it because it's different than the first one. I want to give the first title. What's the title again? Conversations on When Everything is Missions, tagline, Rediscovering the Mission of the Church. So I assume that that, uh, the virtual book launch is going to be available online. Is that right, Matthew? Right. It'll be online tomorrow. Of course, tomorrow is going to be different than when they watch this because it's going to be January. But yes, it's going to be online. if you're interested in that, what go to 1615.org and look for the book launch. 1615.org. This is a continuation of our first book, When Everything is Missions. And now we've introduced 15 other people to the conversation, added their voices, and you're one of those voices. So yeah, we saw you last night and you talked about the deconstruction of the Great Commission. And we'll just leave it at that. They need to log on and listen to it. Your chapter is excellent, by the way. Well, thanks. Appreciate that. Well, hey, listen, we always like to start with the softball, as you know, and um, it's season of Advent. I love Advent, man. It is just the mystery of the incarnation just gets me every single December. And I've uh, just been thinking about Christmas memories right now. And so I want to start with um, what's a childhood Christmas memory that you just continually hold on to? I'll begin. I'll toss it to you, Ted. Mine has to be, and I'm going to might tear up even saying this, my childhood kitchen. My mother cooking lefse and krumkaka. Um, I, I'm of Norwegian descent, if you didn't figure it out with the mention of those two foods there. But lefse is a potato bread. It's a potato flatbread. And man, the kitchen would just fill with the smell of lefse cooking. It's kind of like a Norwegian tortilla, if you will. And then krumkaka and Christmas music in the background, watching my mom cook. That's a childhood memory that I will never forget. How about you, Ted? Well, it's funny. You know, I grew up with both those foods, too, because I have Norwegian descent. I'm kind of like a Scandinavian stew with uh, Norwegian and Dane mixed together. But we had those foods. But the, the memory that always sticks out to me is when I was a little boy, I got this little helicopter gift. It was a helicopter that went around in a circle and you use these two little wires to kind of manipulate it. It was just the most epic gift I, you can imagine for a little boy to get. And when I was about 40, 45 years old, somewhere in there, my brother went out and found that gift. Um, it was the original gift. It was uh, like new in box, but very old. And I got to play with that gift all over again as an adult. And it actually had gotten better through the years. So <laughs> that's, great. that's that's one of my favorite Christmas uh, Christmas memories. So our guest today is Jason Mandrick. And I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself in just a second, Jason. But let's first start with that Christmas question. What's a memory that you have? Right. I think... Uh, the one that sticks out for me, being a, someone who was raised in Canada but been based in the UK for 20 years now, is the, the coming together of the clan. So grandma, grandpa, aunts, uncles, cousins, and somehow all piling into someone's family home and, you know, food, drink, games, laughter, Christmas specials, more food. And then somehow we all managed to find a place to sleep, you know, in this one modest size home, whosoever it was. A bit like uh, John Denver's uh, grandma's feather bed. You just 
you know, everyone piles in wherever they can find a place to sleep and the kids are in sleeping bags on the floor and there's hide beds coming out. And then the next day uh, on Boxing Day, uh, going out and ice skating or playing ice hockey, something that you don't get a lot of here in the UK. So precious. Well, where, where in Canada did you grow up? I grew up mostly in Winnipeg, uh, so Manitoba, central Canada, where yeah. there was always plenty of snow and ice uh, over the Christmas period. Uh, you know, I lived for three years in Canada, and I have a very uh, soft spot for Canada. So, but I was in um, London, Ontario, so okay. a ways away from where you're at. So, uh, Jason, um, we're going to be getting into Operation World and what it's all about, but could you please introduce yourself to our audience so they know who you are? Sure. Well, you've got, got my name already. I've been serving with the Ministry of Operation World for the last uh, 20 plus years. And Operation World is a ministry of WEC International, which is a mission organization founded over 100 years ago by C.T. Studd. And our, um, our focus as an agency is on reaching the unreached or the unevangelized. And uh, I'm the co-leader of the team with my, my colleague, Molly Wall, and I've been involved with multiple editions of Operation World over the years in the areas of research, analysis, writing, editing, production, public ministry. So if someone is completely unaware of what Operation World is, and I bet there's probably not many listening to our call in that camp, but let's assume they don't know what it is. Explain what Operation World is about. Okay, yeah. Um, I think the best way to do that is to give you a, a very abbreviated origin story of Operation World. It was founded by Patrick Johnstone in the 1960s when he was a mission missionary serving in Southern Africa uh, with another agency called the Dorothea Mission. And, and his work was primarily doing evangelism in the rapidly expanding uh, urban shanty towns and slums of apartheid era South Africa and Zimbabwe and other countries around there. And churches, African churches, were, were growing rapidly at that time because of evangelism in part, also because of rapid population growth. And these churches were gathering together for like a camp week, uh, a week of praise and worship, of Bible study, of, uh, of teaching and preaching, of fellowship and of prayer. And because of the fact that it was in the 1960s and it was in Africa and it was during the apartheid era, these African brothers and sisters had very little access to knowledge about what was going on in the outside world. Uh, but they felt a burden to pray for the nations. They didn't know what to pray uh, for China or for Russia or for Brazil or for Norway or whichever country. And so they asked the missionaries who were a mix of Westerners and Africans to help furnish them with some information that would enable them to pray in an informed manner for the needs of these other nations. And Patrick got assigned to um, basically cobble together a little booklet that was uh, 16 pages folded in half, you know, in black and white, typed out on a typewriter and then uh, reproduced. Love that. Uh, that featured 30 different countries and very simple prayer points and hand-drawn, um, hand-shaded maps that he had done himself. And the church really, you know, they really took to this and they really began to press into sustained prayer. And then they said, you know, we want more of this. And Patrick said, well, if I'm going to do this again, I think we should do it for every country, not just a handful of countries. Um, little did he know the amount of work that would be going into that and the, the millions of copies in many languages that have been distributed in the subsequent decades. Uh, but that was how it was born. It was out of the desire of the African church to pray for the nations and to engage in, in its own missionary response to, um, to their own uh, missional con construct and context. It grew from that time, Patrick and his family and the Ministry of Operation World relocated to the UK, uh, where it's been based since 1980, uh, where it still is now. And uh, the various formats and forms of media in which we continue to produce information that's based on research and consultation in order to mobilize mission and prayer for the whole world, that continues, but it obviously looks very different um, technologically speaking, from what was the norm in 1965. 
That's a fascinating story. I, I had no idea about the history and um, it just enriches it even more for me knowing how it began in South Africa. So my family, um, my kids are 22, 20 and 17, but when they were little, we used the kids version. I can't remember what it's called. A Windows on the World, is that, is that right? Yeah. The first children's version was called You Can Change the World. And then it was retitled in a subsequent edition to Window on the World. Yeah, and so uh, we've benefited from it many times, the children's version and of course the Operation World version. Uh, but I'd be curious to know how widespread the use of Operation World is. That's a good question. I mean, we, we have information about, you know, how many copies of a publication might be printed and, and distributed. I think one of the areas that would probably be deemed a success in a sense is that Operation World has gone from being virtually the only kind of ministry or the only kind of resource of this nature that's available to becoming just one uh, amongst the family of resources that exists for the purpose of informing the global church and mobilizing toward mission and prayer. So um, resources like the perspectives uh, course and all of the all of the publications that are associated with that, including other groups that are within the family of perspectives. Uh, resources like the Joshua Project, which focuses on ethno-linguistic people groups. Uh, resources like PrayerCast, which has a very similar vision to Operation World, but frames it through short, uh, easily engageable video. Um, there, there are others as well, many others. And so I think in part, a lot of these exist because Operation World helped to set the stage to recognize the scope of the Great Commission and the task unfinished and gave people a, a, a framework and a platform to take their own passion, their own sets of gifts, their own domain of media and begin to do the same kind of um, information-based mobilizing of prayer and mobilizing of mission into the broader framework. And, and so that's great that we're no longer the only, um, the only resource that points people toward mission or that uh, engages them in prayer for the nations. It's good that there's more stuff out there. Um, we've always been a small team from day one until now. It's always been a missionary team. So people involved are volunteers or, or supported missionaries, either with WEC or with another agency. And so we really also believe in the, the idea that this is a, a missionary team that serves together that produces this resource. It's not a, uh, it's not a corporate driven structure in that sense. And, and that it is deliberately uh, globalized and consultative. The way that we want to write about the countries is based, yes, of course, on research, but it's also based on engaging and listening to Christian leaders from the places that we're writing about and getting them to give input and changing what we would say or changing how we would pray about those nations based on what the people who know those nations best, the, the Christian leaders who are from those places and are serving in those contexts. So the network element of Operation World has always been very essential. And of course, that's much easier to do in today's world than it was back in the apartheid era Zimbabwe or Southern Rhodesia, as it was then called. T tell us a little bit about how you actually do the data collection. Yeah, there, I guess there's kind of three, three main streams uh, to what we do. And, and the first element of that is we subscribe to publications journals, magazines, newsletters, um, circulars, um, all, all kinds of both secular, broadly Christian, as well as uh, missiologically specific, sometimes global, all the way down to maybe a specific country or a specific people group. And we subscribe to these and we share that reading out amongst the team. And we take note of the stuff that would help to inform and shape how we want to write prayer points or how we would uh, include the data in our analysis of the data for a country. So that's the incoming stream. Then there's also the, the stream of activity where we go out and we find the information that we know we need. Uh, we're aware that we lack this information and so we go out and find it. And that might be denominational data, uh, where we can get it. It might be uh, missionary demographics, like uh, how many people are serving in this country, although that's of course increasingly difficult to both define and obtain. Um, or what are the most strategic and important uh, areas that we can press into intercession for this country or for this region? And you go and you try to find what you can. The third stream, which is in, in some ways the most important, 
is that relational network of people with whom we connect. Um, in every country, if we can, although often there are very small or remote countries that can be quite difficult to find people on the ground, um, and we ask them, how can the global church be praying for your nation? And we send them our draft of what we've compiled, and we say, everything that you want to change, show us. How can we, how can we make this better? And then through a, a consultative process and back and forth with them, not just that with an individual, but sometimes it's an entire, um, an entire group that works together on that process. Sometimes it's different key people in a country with whom we're individually in contact. And so, so through that uh, synthetical process, we arrive at a draft that we're happy to publish and they're happy to have published that represents their country well. Do you ever get people to kind of campaign, this really has to be in there, this really has to be in there, but it's, you do, huh? <laughs> Inevitably, right? There's always been um, a push and pull, and of course, some people feel very passionately about a particular issue. Yeah. Um, I remember in one instance, there were, there were two contacts that we had from a certain uh, Latin American country, and one of them was very optimistic and enthusiastic about the evangelical population of that country. Another was very, um, let's say, had a narrower understanding of who belonged within evangelicalism and it was also very cautious um, with regard to numbers and counting. And so the, they had these widely divergent um, you know, frameworks from which they could enumerate evangelicals. And we had to listen to them both and, and come up with an answer that, that satisfied them both. And of course, we have our own internal consistent methodology as for how to do that. So when we walk people through it, even if they disagree with our conclusions, they can see the rationale as to how we arrived at it. Um, and the other thing is very often, and Patrick was a master at doing this in his day, I'm, I'm trying to learn from his example. And that is that, that sometimes the people who are most vociferous in their responses let's say after they get an edition of Operation World, they'll write in and say, you got this issue totally wrong and here's, you know, here's all the points or you have to change this. The best way to improve our material is to turn them from, from critics into allies. Mm -hmm. And very often those people are so passionate about their country or about this issue that when you begin to come alongside and direct that passion and work together within that, you can come up with really excellent material that incorporates both their framework, our own framework, and ends up with something much better than either could have accomplished on its own. Neat. So when it happened, you know, the world is changing so rapidly right now. I mean, right? It is moving at a fast click. So I'd be curious to know how often you publish. I, I would think that a lot of the information, um, not, not that praying for any country or people group is stale. I mean, it's God, God's going to interpret those prayers and, and it's going to, you know, do his work, but the actual data is changing. How often do you publish? Well, when you're talking about the big thick book, then um, it's been 10 years now since that came out. We published a subsequent work, which was a, a simplified version called um, Pray for the World. Subsequent to that, we published an app, which is uh, free called Operation World on both uh, iPhone and Android platforms. And that is a good point because one of the advantages of having an app is that I can go in and update something and hypothetically speaking, it can be ruled out the next day. Um, and so it is able. I'm glad that you said God can interpret those prayers because the reality is, there we go, excellent. The reality is that none of us have 100% um, accuracy and, and uh, per perspicaciousness on how best to pray for any country. We do the best we can. The very nature of data is that if you're seeing it, it's already obsolete in a sense, because the context will have changed between the time that it was produced and when you're reading it. However, we also recognize that when we're praying for nations and we're praying about strategic issues that are at the heart and soul of how a nation understands itself and the missiological challenges that exist, um, we can get caught up in the, the cult of the new and the, the microwave mentality that everything has to be instant when really robust, deep, consultative research processes take time. And the world is a big place. And as much as in some ways you're absolutely the right that everything is moving at breakneck pace and accelerating into the future, in a lot of ways, um, 
that's not the case, that countries in some of the more um, profound missiological challenges are very much the same today as they were 10, 20, even 50 years ago. And part of global intercession is that persistence that you just keep adding prayers into the bowl or chipping away at the wall or whenever, whatever analogy you want to use. And one day you keep praying in the faith that one day that's going to reach the tipping point and we see the kingdom of God break through. And aren't, aren't we all grateful that the way God answers our prayers is not limited to the way that we pray them. Uh, and that's crucial. Uh, beautiful. Well, what I'd like to do when we're, when we're finished with this discussion today, the very last thing is today, uh, Ukraine comes up on the app. Now it's not going to be what comes up when you listen to the podcast, but I'm going to read the paragraph and we'll end that way. And then we're going to encourage the podcast listeners to pray um, wherever they're at, whenever they listen to it for the nation of Ukraine. Um, Jason, could you tell us what's the biggest joy for you in being engaged in this work? Ooh, yeah. Well, it's an incredible privilege to be seated at this awkward or uncomfortable, but, but very dynamic uh, place where the prayer movements, the mission movements, and the research movements come together. And where those converge, amazing stuff happens. Um, sometimes, sometimes the stuff that happens is conflict or, or disagreement. But out of that, there's always energy. And there's always excitement. And so it's a real privilege to be sitting where those spheres intersect. I think the privilege of being able to engage with and listen to and learn from uh, the body of Christ all around the world. Um, you know, each of... Thankfully, the world is becoming more multicultural and more globalized, but what we have, regardless of where we're from, the blind spots that we have in our faith, the cultural baggage that we carry in our Christianity that we're not even aware of, that kind of stuff gets exposed when you begin to relate to the global body of Christ, and it helps all of us be truly part of a, a global body together. We have so much to learn as Canadians or Brits or Americans from the church in Nigeria and what God is doing in the mission movement there, from the church in China, from the church in Brazil, from the church in North Korea. Uh, we have so much that we can learn, even while we have a lot that we can offer. And to, to be in the place where that interaction is occurring, it is a joy and it is a privilege. And we want to share it through Operation World with the rest of the body of Christ. You know, when we were in the waiting room before we started recording, we were talking about the racial tensions today, issues of race and strife. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm reminded again of a quote from Mark Twain, one of my favorites. He says, travel is fatal to prejudice. It's much more robust than that. Yeah. You it up. But, you know, we can't travel right now during COVID, but we can travel with our prayers. And, and I love that you hit on that. One of the ways that we can see unity in the body of Christ and really dismantling of some of those things is by praying for the world and understanding what the rest of the world is going through. So this is, this is timely. Operation World's always been timely, but I think it has a special place right now in this segment of history that we find ourselves in. Yeah, which makes a great responsibility for us. I'm reminded of another quote uh, that actually you, you mentioned a, a, a little while ago, and that was the Oswald Chambers quote, that prayer does not fit us for the greater work. Prayer is the greater work. And when we're locked down because of a, a global pandemic, and when we see the news of what's unfolding in other places, I think hopefully one of the outcomes of, of COVID and out of all of the crises of 2020 is a, a global church that has learned how to re-engage in intercession. Well, I'd like to kind of finish with the future. Um, so you said the last print book was 10 years ago. Maybe you're not going to print anymore. I don't know what you're thinking, but... What, what's the, what does the future hold for Operation World? Yeah, well, God knows, and we're planning in that direction. I think the most important part is, yes, we absolutely plan another version of Operation World while recognizing the accelerating technological changes and the, the fundamental shift in what we understand to be a new cycle in the world today. Even if we want to push back against some of those elements, um, and that's why we've gone to an app, and that's why we will continue to engage with digital content, and that may become the main and most dynamic way in which we're pushing out content that informs 
that mobilizes and that hopefully draws people to prayer. Now, the last edition of Operation World, um, over a thousand pages, pretty dense, got translated into two languages, uh, Korean and surprisingly Indonesian. Uh, but then the abbreviated version, which we did in order to facilitate translation, this, this has gone out in more than 10 languages. So we recognize that in some ways, bigger is not better. Um, and we want to actually be able to engage with people who don't read in English. And so part of that is getting the resources in into other languages, but part of that is getting it into formats that are non-books. And so they, that may be an app, that may be videos, that may be podcasts, that may be um, reports. And so we are um, shifting towards a, a more constantly updated and maintained digital uh, resource, while at the same time, our plan is to publish something that's smaller than this, but still substantive uh, on a more frequent basis uh, that allows us to have a continual turnover of data and a more up-to-date uh, and fresh feel for each subsequent edition. We're beginning work on that now. It'll be a few years before it's all completed, but we're, the building blocks are in place right now, and we're beginning to build the team and get the momentum going. Great. Meanwhile, we update the app. So Ted, let's uh, move to the Ukraine piece. You were going to read that, and then we'll end the show with our special segment we always do. All right. So today, the information on Ukraine, this is just the kind of the opening paragraph. There's more data on here. If you've not seen this app, you should get the app Operation World at your, whatever your app store is. Communism fell 25 years ago, but its effects persist. The new market economy drove many into poverty, while a few gained extreme wealth through corrupt means. These powerful oligarchs make money from Ukraine, but usually invest their riches outside the country. Ukraine's economic troubles increased the political tension between East and West. When communism ended, the empty space without values or morals led to a rapid increase of hopelessness, alcoholism, and the spread of HIV AIDS. Many opportunities exist for holistic and compassionate ministries and believers must not miss this open door. So please pray for Ukraine uh, when this podcast ends. Yeah, Patrick, you made an uh, allusion earlier about filling the bowls. I'm assuming you were thinking of Revelation chapter five. That's an aspect to, yeah, what I was referring to. Yeah, uh, beautiful picture. The suggestion there is that I think the prayers of the saints are at least in part prayers for the nations. So let's fill the bowls today with prayers for the people of Ukraine. And as Ted said, download the app and make this part of our rhythm of our relationship with Christ because the world is on his heart. So uh, thanks so much, Patrick. What a blessing to be with you today. We've got one more segment here that we always do with Ted. Ted reveals to us something he likes. So Ted, what is on the list today? Well, you know, I get a lot of books sent to me. Um, and I, I'm a digital guy. I read most stuff digitally. I don't do a lot of paper books anymore, but this one got sent to me in paper format. It's called Press On. It's by David, uh, Dave Giles. And Dave is the um, leader of a mission called Encompass Global. It's uh, the mission agency affiliated with the Brethren denomination uh, here in the U.S., and they have a huge footprint in Africa with churches that they planted, um, you know, 100 years ago. Huge footprint there. But what's interesting, this is a, a devotional book with a very strong cross-cultural emphasis to it. And um, you, you, you read through it, you do Bible readings, you respond to questions here. It's just an excellent resource if you're in global mission. If you're on the field and you're looking to kind of fill up the tank, or if you're considering it, this book is uh, really a great challenge. Um, so that's one thing. I actually got to throw in another thing here, Matthew. All right. A little bonus segment for us, as it were. So I've been experimenting a lot with uh, Zoom and the best way to do it from my home office. And I know this is a topic that a lot of people are talking about. And a piece of advice that I've gotten over and over again is forget about your camera worry about the lighting. And so I've actually got kind of a fancy light set up here. Now I've got too much blue in me today. I can tell by looking at the Zoom call, but I ignored the advice about the camera and I actually bought myself a new camera and I bought a cheap camera, 18, 20 bucks. My old camera was three or four years old. 
And this one is twice the camera. Now it's not a perfect solution because it's a wide angle. So I'm sitting really close to it. And I don't really like that a whole lot. But the point is just that sometimes you get advice and that advice might not be right. So you have to experiment. And um, just the whole concept of experimenting is also something I like. So I wanna encourage everybody to be creatively experimenting with their Zoom setups to make them just a little bit better. So, and by the way, you, you Mac book users, we know who you are, okay? Because you're always looking at us down on the screen like this. So <laughs> we've got that a little bit. So that's yeah. something I like today. Great, great. Uh, thanks, Ted. Always good to be with you. And Jason, what a great interview. Really appreciate the work you're doing. And uh, man, I, I don't know who said it, but, but the least we can do is the most we can do. Prayer is what mm. is so needed today. Always needed, but especially now. So thanks for being with us. to be with you. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Bless you. Before you go, would you visit our host's websites? There you will find a wealth of interesting and challenging information about the state of the Great Commission. They are 1615.org and missionexus.org. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share, and subscribe so you don't miss one. Thanks again to our sponsor, Support Raising Solutions. Make sure to check out their website at supportraisingsolutions.org. The Mission Matters is presented through a partnership between 1615 Missions Coaching and Missio Nexus.